I will sit for like 20 to 30 minutes. <clears throat> so finding a posture that's supportive and upright, comfortable. You might move and stretch the body a little bit first to find that posture. You're welcome to stand up. And by all means, doing your thing, you know, your practice, your way. And this evening, I'll guide specifically for awareness of breath and the low belly. And you do what works for you. I think Phil is probably going to gaze upon the candle, the asked for specifically. So this candle is here in the center if that supports you. Sound is also a great object of awareness. And the body as a whole or some particular sensation in the body, the hands, the feet, the body sitting here. I'm settling into your chosen posture for this practice period. As we might say with the kids, getting the wiggles out first and the wiggles out, letting them express themselves. And then finding your mindful body. Finding your mindful body. Finding stillness and ease. Coming home to yourself, tuning into yourself. And noticing what you're aware of, noticing where your attention is drawn naturally without doing anything. Noticing where your attention is naturally drawn without doing anything. Perhaps it's drawn to the sensation of hands resting wherever they might be. The gentle pressure, the warmth, or a different sensation. Or perhaps attention is drawn to sound, awareness of hearing, These conditioned sounds arising and passing as all conditioned experience does, arising and passing. Arising and passing.
And perhaps the tension is strong to the sensations of the feet. Maybe a tingling or pulsing is discernible. Maybe not. Maybe the gentle pressure as they rest wherever they might be. These feet. Not having to do anything right now. Or you might feel the whole body just being here, resting. And maybe you feel the pulse of blood in your system, feeling the body alive in fact, with vitality. Really appreciating this heart. Knowing how fragile it is. Can you feel it? Can you feel into the beating of the heart? Pumping blood throughout this whole organism. Mindfulness does not care what it is mindful of. Allowing ourselves to rest in awareness in whatever way is most supportive for now. And if you're interested journeying with me into the experience of breath, in the body. And if you've landed elsewhere and you're inspired to stay there, great. Hang out with that candle flame or whatever is supportive for you. This is your practice. I'm here, the Sangha is here, the collective is here to support and guide you not to tell you what you're supposed to do. My hope is that you will learn more and more to listen in, to discern, and to care for yourself. So if you want, come along as we explore awareness of the sensation of breath in the body. Beginning with the nostrils. Feeling the breath in the nostrils. 
maybe as it enters, feeling the ring of both nostrils as that cool air comes in. Or feeling it a little deeper into the nose or even on the back of the throat. As the inhale happens. And noticing perhaps the energizing nature of the inhalation. It's a little bit exciting to breathe in this fresh, cool air. Noticing what happens in the heart as we bring the breath in through the nostrils. Maybe there's nothing there to notice, that's fine, but checking it out. For me in this moment, I can notice that the inhalation of the nostrils is also bringing a smile onto my face as a joy a subtle joy and appreciation, a warming of the heart, warmth in the heart. And as I breathe out, I feel the slightly warmer air as it leaves the nostrils. And I notice my body releasing, relaxing, settling. What's happening for you? Noticing. Becoming interested, becoming open and aware of your experience. Tuning into yourself. And of course, there's all kinds of other things happening too. No problem. We're cultivating awareness. It's a path. It's a journey. It's a practice. And continuing into the body a little more, observing the sensation of breath in the chest. Knowing, remembering, reminding ourselves there's room for it all. The myriad experiences internally and externally, they all can be held in the field of awareness. And then if it's supportive, exploring, resting into awareness of the sensation of breath in the chest. Not pushing, straining or striving. No delusion that this is the right way or what you're supposed to do. But exploring the experience. Exploring the experience of being breathed.
feeling the chest expanding and contracting. Not making it do anything, not causing anything to happen. Or rather, tuning in to this experience that's always here, as long as we're alive this constant companion of the breath, befriending it, befriending our experience, befriending ourselves. Healing the breath in the body. Or maybe consciously, intentionally sitting up a little taller, broadening the shoulders so there's more room, or not. And allowing awareness to drop in a little more deeply. into the experience of breath in the low belly core. Feeling the rising and falling the low belly. And practicing to rest into that. To relax into that. You don't have to do anything. We can rest and be and cultivate awareness of what's happening inside. Feeling this life-giving experience of being brief. And I'm remembering that beautiful medicine. <laughs> How can I care for myself in this moment? <laughs> and there's room for it all. <laughs> Nothing need be held outside of the field of awareness.
Resting. Resting down into the low belly core. Experiencing the movement down there that accompanies each breath. And of course, thoughts arise in the mind, no problem. There's room for this too. <laughs> And when we notice when we notice compassion arising in our hearts, our judgment in the mind, or some planning or obsessing, We practice to remember there's room for this too. As we expand out into our chosen practice, perhaps resting in awareness of breath in the low belly core. Or whatever you're engaging with right now. Feeling into it, being with it. Resting. Being held by your direct experience, by awareness of your direct experience. Perhaps the breath in the low belly.
perhaps awareness of the whole body resting here. Perhaps awareness of sound arising and passing, knowing it all can be held in the field of awareness. Resting and opening. Resting and opening. Opening to the sound of the bell, allowing yourself to rest into the experience of receiving the bell. Mm. 
No need to do anything. Just resting into the bell. And savoring this experience we've all engaged in of caring for ourselves as we allow things to unfold, freedom from that compulsion to fix, enjoying resting, so allowing this experience, however you're feeling in the moment, to expand out and support you as you gradually bring in awareness of movement, you expand your field of vision, your own speed and pace, be with yourself as we move from stillness practice into whatever's next. When you're ready, as you're ready, and sight starts to become part of what you're doing, taking in the space that you're in and noticing what you notice. Where are your eyes drawn? And what happens inside as a response to that or as a result of that? And listening to the body, how does the body want to move? How does the body want to be stretched or cared for or tended to? Standing up, if that's what feels good, really listening in, how can I care for myself in this moment? Before the sit, we talked about a, a couple of different things, kind of all of a piece, but different facets. How can I be kind to myself in this moment? How can I care for myself in this moment? The principle of impermanence that everything's arising and passing. And then from a few different angles, the kind of habit we might have of, of resisting it or fighting it or the layering in of, of more gunk with second arrows. And I want to explore a specific application. Again, I'd like a show of hands, please fully engage. Don't raise your hand if it's not true for you, but please don't be shy about raising your hand. How many of you are hard on yourselves? Hmm, look around. Yeah, everyone, everyone is raising their hands. 
right? How many of you are hard on yourselves? I'm sure it's not just us, right? The 18 or 20 of us <laughs> who are here, right? Like, no. Ah. And I love the idea that it doesn't have to be that way. There's a story that's offered of a talk. I think it was in the United States. Yeah, I'm going to put it in the U.S. The Dalai Lama had come and many people were gathered. And one of the practitioners asked the Dalai Lama, what about self-loathing? How do I practice with that? How do I care for that? And the Dalai Lama's English is pretty good. Mostly he has a translator, but he, he speaks English well. I've heard him speak English. <laughs> he doesn't understand the question. And uh, he's talking to his translator for quite a while, not sharing anything out to the community, talking, talking. He finally understands the question. He just laughs. He laughs uproariously. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Like the idea, the concept of it was like just totally anathema to him. And I don't think that's just because he's like his holiness, the Dalai Lama. I think it's cultural. And here we are in this culture where it's the norm, right? Here we are, everyone raised their hand. Mm. And I, that feels like the first piece that I want to name is that it doesn't have to be that way. It is that way. Like it's universal, universal. <laughs> it's something universal. I don't know if it's Western universal or U.S. universal or America. I don't know what the limits of, but it has some space in which it's universal, which of course is an oxymoron. But anyway, it's a very shared, well-known experience and it's conditioned. It isn't this way for all human beings. It's just not. So then we can recognize, oh, there are conditions at play. As we spoke of in the beginning, right? everything is conditioned. It arises and passes. So there are some conditions such that this vast number of people has a habit to be hard on ourselves. Okay. Does that information give you any peace or ease? Like, yeah. It's conditioned. It's a habit. Do you feel just maybe a, a little sliver of like, oh, yeah, OK. For me, that awareness, that information, that understanding helps me to not take it so personally. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. And maybe I can do something to help a little bit. And I think that's where those other two pieces come in. Of how can I be kind to myself in this moment? Oh, this is a moment of suffering. Right back to dukkha's to be known. Oh, this is a moment of suffering. And then a little bit, of, I got you. I'm here for you. What does that look like? And more and more for me, this simple question of how can I be kind to myself in this moment? And then I take a simple wise action. I feel the love and care of that. I feel the tenderness of like, oh, I'm here for you. Look, here's some water. And I allow myself to bring my full attention to that little sip of water. Two hands on the mug helps a lot. And I'm present. And even as I put the mug down, I feel a settling in my body. And a little bit of okayness, a little bit of, oh, it's okay. Right? There's this capacity to be with it. And I'm not caught in the what it should cut us. Yeah, there are some that I have some agency over. And I can take a next action to support care. And the past has happened. And that past, like, that's one second ago, one minute ago, one hour ago, one day ago, one year ago. Like, I can't influence any of that. And right now, oh, I can bring my full attention to this little mug. And already there's a lift in my spirit. 
How can I be kind to myself in this moment? And then this radical practice of stopping. That was a 30 minute meditation. We gave ourselves a gift of 30 minutes. And even if you only have time to give yourself a gift of three breaths in awareness, or we stop when I'm here holding space, we stop when we hear the church bells next door. So we can just rest into this experience of bells. They call us home to ourselves. They call us home to now. We don't have to do anything. We can just rest. Then in a few minutes, 10 minutes, we'll get more bells and we'll wrap up. Tonight, as we were sitting here, there was some music that played on the street as often does. And for me, I just got to rest into the delight of the music. Like I, I knew the song and I appreciated the story of the lyrics. But more than that, it was just the delight of not fighting it. The delight of like not needing things to be some special way. But the capacity to open to this is what's here now. It changes everything. It changes everything. They know. <laughs> Car just hums. <laughs> yeah. So reflecting for yourself, what are the things you're currently doing? Or could you hmm. I want to say, or could you imagine yourself doing, but I'm not talking about imagination. I'm talking about like actual possible pragmatic things. What are the things you're currently doing, small and large, to care for yourself, to tend to yourself? You're all here right now, so that's a, pretty, that's a significant thing, carving out an hour and a half. And I bet you're doing some other things. Or perhaps, as I offer the question, you rest into your body, an aspiration or two arises. I have a long habit of being really hard on myself. And I know, I know that it's well-intentioned. I know that my dad, probably my mom, definitely my dad's father, their habit of constantly trying to help me (laughs) by correcting me, correcting, correcting, correcting. I don't know about you, but I mostly experience correcting as criticism and then I feel like I'm doing something wrong and then pretty quickly it's there's something wrong with me there's all of this condition and I'm supposed to be other than I am I'm supposed to know something that I don't know yet I don't know about you I hope none of you suffered this but I had the privilege of being able to go to college and to go to college specifically to receive an education not for a career um, and I remember being in college first year of college particularly in my Western Civ class, Western Civilization class, history class. Thinking I was already supposed to know the stuff that I was being taught. Thinking I was already supposed to know the stuff I was being taught. I was 20, 19, no, no, I wasn't 20, I was 17. Of course, I thought I was totally grown. I thought I was grown at 12, but anyway, 17. Already supposed to know what I'm being taught. I don't think it was until I was in my late 30s or 40 even, probably 30s that I realized how crazy that was. I was going to school. I was going to school to learn if I already knew what was the point, right? And so today, now in my early 50s, I'm delighted to learn and to grow and to experience and to recognize it's a gift. 
And I have less and less of that. I'm already supposed to know everything. So are already supposed to have it figured out. And that brings me a lot of freedom. And I know today that my dad and my grandfather, maybe my mom and others, I remember more clearly from the two of them. That thing that they did that I took as criticism that I internalized and continued, you know, pick up that whip and beat myself to inspire myself and encourage myself and to be more productive and contribute to society and with all kinds of nonsense. But there is another way. There's a kinder, gentler way that's rooted in love and care and compassion. And we can inspire ourselves rather than beat ourselves up in order to move forward. We can notice what feels good and where it feels good and how that allows us to move in the direction that feels good and that can be forward moving. And then it doesn't have to be some way that we shit on ourselves with the hope that that's going to inspire us. Because it doesn't inspire me. It makes me feel terrible. And it's conditioned like, oh yeah, there's that habit. Okay, hi, I got you, right? I can recognize that that habit has arisen. I offer myself some love and care. I love skin on skin. Those of you who've been practicing with me for a while know that. The skin on skin, the power of that embrace that simple and kind act of self-love. Try it on, if you will, with me now. And feel the warmth and the gentle embrace as you hold yourself with love. A hug can be nice. I like to do the hug when I can get skin on skin, but this kind of a hug, I get my arms up under my sleeves. And feel the love you can offer yourself. That you're okay just as you are. Totally and completely imperfect. Totally human. And we don't have to fight it. You know, we don't have to fight that stuff that isn't the way we want it to be. Because there's always stuff that isn't the way we want it to be. You're not going to be perfect. And what if that wasn't the goal? What if that wasn't the goal? What if the goal was to notice? and care notice and care let's sit just allowing that aspiration to notice and care to settle the distillation of all we've practiced tonight Allowing yourself to feel it in the body and to know that each time you notice that you're starting to shit on yourself or whatever your flavor is, if you notice it and you care for yourself instead, you're changing your conditioning, you're changing the neurology, you're changing the neural pathways in your brain, in your heart, in your gut. You're doing it because you care, because you can. Notice and care. There's room for it all. We don't have to fight or push away. We can rest and heal.
And as you're inspired, if it's comfortable for you, bring your hands together to form a small lotus bud, signifying or representing the potential for awakening. In all beings, in every moment, May any benefit we've received by gathering and practicing together in this way, may it ripple out as we take notice and care and are thereby kinder to ourselves and kinder to all we engage with and interact with. And then those people and beings and things that we interact with and are kinder to, they are then kinder out. It ripples and ripples and ripples. So their practice may be of benefit to all beings and bring peace. Thank you, each and every one of you for being here this evening on Zoom and here in person. It's your presence that allows this to happen. We're co-creating a, a Sangha together, a community of practitioners. And the Sangha is vital. We hear and learn and grow from each other and see ourselves reflected in one another. Right? I, I hope it was powerful for you to have that question over of who's part of themselves and to see everyone raise their hands. Oh, right. Maybe just that can bring some relief. Yeah. I'm really honored to be able to be here to share the Dharma as I experience it and as it arises, as I am here with you. Yeah, and your, your presence is enough. Your practice is enough. That's the most valuable, most valuable gift. And if, it, if you have the energy to offer time to the collective, we're always looking for volunteers. And if you're pocketbook allows a financial contribution to me and the collective that's also quite welcome you can do that online Walter will probably put information in the chat and then the stuff's over there you can talk to tom to get more information about that and you can email the collective if you want to volunteer and this is this is my livelihood this is what i do i get to uh, be a teacher of this of this beautiful path that has helped me so much. <laughs> oh, and it's a joy to share with others. And whatever works, totally works. Hmm. And I, has, I have an intention to practice saying this. I haven't said it all the time and hopefully won't get too rote, but I wanna name that we, we learn and we study and we come to understand in Buddhism that there are three poisons of greed, aversion, and delusion. And when we find freedom from those three poisons, we got some freedom. And I think it's helpful for me sometimes to think about that as, so greed, aversion, delusion, non-greed, what's it look like? Generosity. So here we can practice generosity. You practice generosity in your presence and your attention and your practice. That's a gift of generosity. The other ways I just named are available also. Non-greed, non-aversion, right? Ugh, freedom from this. Right, non-aversion. What's non-aversion? Love. I don't know if you had any love bubbling up in you, but I know I did at the end. of like, oh yeah, there's this love here. Oh, yay. And not because I was chasing after it and not dependent on another being, animal or person, not dependent on some external conditions, just emergent love. And delusion, non-delusion, clear scene. And clear scene arises when the gunk settles. It doesn't arise so we're like trying to clean it up, right? It just serves everything up. It arises when the gunk settles. So may your practice support you in finding freedom from those three poisons. Take good care. And um, I'd love to meet the people who are here for their first time and you introduce yourselves to each other as you're, as you're willing and able. And thank you, Zoom. Love you. May your surgery go well. We look forward to seeing you as you're able to, to come. Yeah, great. Take good care. Yeah, so welcome, welcome, welcome.